Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. We lie back with you. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the AAMFT podcast. Another great installment of the Pioneer Series for you today with someone I have known and looked up to for a long time, Dr. Richard Schwartz. Dick earned his PhD from Purdue, after which he began a long association with the Institute of Juvenile Research at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's also spent some time at the Family Institute at Northwestern University, places near and dear to my heart, before starting his Center for Self-Leadership in Oak Park, Illinois in 2000. You guys know Dick Schwartz as the developer of internal family systems. That's IFS for short. IFS developed in response to clients' descriptions of experiencing various parts, many extreme within themselves. Dick noticed Uh, When these parts felt safe and they had their concerns addressed, they were less disruptive and they would accede to the wise leadership that Dick came to name the self. And in developing IFS, he recognized that as just like in systemic family therapy, parts can take on characteristic roles that help define the inner world of the client. And the self is the part that leads. This is uh, quite a unique and personal interview will dick will tell you about his own parts those exiled young parts and how he went on to develop his model you might also know him from one of the most popular family therapy texts of the last 30 years along with mike nichols nichols and schwartz family therapy concept and methods he's the author of four other books internal family systems therapy Introduction to the Internal Family Systems Model, and The Mosaic of the Mind. He's also written one you can share for your clients called You Are the One You've Been Waiting For. Find out more about Dick at selfleadership.org. Very special interview. We'll be back when it's over. Okay, let's welcome Dr. Richard Schwartz to the AMFT podcast. And I've known him for a while, so it's okay if I call you Dick, right? Please. All right. Um, This is the segment on the show that I look most forward to. It's really, you know, many people read about model developers in a textbook and they learn the theory and the interventions and the techniques behind the model. But this segment is really designed to know the person behind the model. And uh, Dick Schwartz has a very fascinating story. The first question, our paths have uh, overlapped uh, in our career. I've uh, always looked up to Dick, and the way I appreciate his work is very different now than when I entered the field 20 years ago, and we'll talk about the evolution of internal family systems or the IFS model. But the first question, Dick, is always, uh, how did you decide to become an MFT? How did you get into family therapy to start with? Uh, Okay, Uh, just... uh before I get going, just great to talk to you, Eli, and always enjoy it. And uh, I wanted to dedicate this to our mutual mentor, Doug Sprinkle, who died this year. So, uh, Yeah, he, he's a great man that um, has influenced so many people. And uh, that is where you were one of his first students, uh, and I was one of his, his last students. So, yeah, that will be, that's certainly part of your story. So even before you met Doug, how'd you get into this? Okay, so when I was in college, I uh, got a job through my father, who was head of medicine at a big medical center in Chicago. 
<clears throat> on the psychiatric unit in the summers and uh, breaks, and I was what was called an occupational therapy aide, which meant basically I played with the patients. And those were in the days when a lot of acting out adolescent kids were being hospitalized. And, um, you know, it was, it was the mid-early 60s, and uh, a lot of parents were really scared. And so I would be hanging out with these kids who weren't that much younger than me, and I could identify with, and getting close to them, uh, it was an adolescent unit, and uh, I would, you know, hear their stories as I would take them bowling or whatever we were doing, and I would also hear about what was happening with their therapy. It was a fairly psychoanalytic unit, psychodynamic, I guess. And then I would also be in the day room when the families would visit. And uh, there was one kid in particular I got very close to who, uh, who would tell me a little bit about having been sexually abused by her father. And then, then the family would visit and uh, both parents would tear into her. I would be in the day room, not too far from them when they were doing that. And, and then I would hear about her, her sessions, which didn't really include her family at all. It was all about her intrapsychic process and interpretations, and you know what I'm talking about. And uh, it didn't square. It just made no sense to me. And so I, I thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I th at that point, I hadn't heard about family therapy. In fact, it hardly existed, I think. And... Uh, but I, I got very interested in external systems and the impact they have on individuals and uh, start, heard about Gregory Bateson's work and uh, some of the other systems thinkers and started looking around for a program that would address some of this and went to a master's program actually in community mental health because I thought I'd be a community organizer but uh, found I wasn't any good at that. <laughs> I'm too introverted. But there was a family therapist in that program named Earl Goodman who uh, was just kind of learning it himself. And so there was a group of us that uh, would work with him, one of whom was Howie Little, who, as you know, has become a prominent uh, family therapist himself with a model of his own. And we had one-way mirrors, and uh, so we were doing all kinds of stuff. So it was, it was really out of that, uh, those observations on the psych unit that uh, I got. As a, as a very young guy in your, your early 20s, and then, you know, it's interesting, you, you know, we know of our blueprint, which comes from our family of origin. I know how highly... Uh, you thought of your father and you mentioned, you know, he was a physician and we think of medicine as having this very linear um, perspective, which is very different than a systemic way of thinking. Um, some people find family therapy and they learn systemic language, but they know they've always kind of thought that way. Did you always think that way, Dick? And then you just found the language once you started studying family therapy? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I was raised by him and as you say, medicine is uh, pretty linear, that there's, you've got a disease and it's caused by this virus or this other thing. And, uh, but I credit him for giving me the motivation to develop IFS because uh, I was the oldest of six boys and I was supposed to be a physician researcher and three of my brothers are basically a couple of them very, very prominent. Uh, but I was the big disappointment because I just didn't have a head for that kind of science. And, uh, and it was also kind of spacey. I wasn't a good student. And so he was really hard on me at different points and gave me what I'll call in the IFS language the burden of worthlessness that some of my parts took in. You, you, you loved him and you respected him, yet you didn't feel 
like you measured up for him, professionally speaking. Yeah, and I had parts that were desperate to change that, you know, to be uh, validated by him uh, because of that. And, and so some of the impetus to go through what I had to go through to bring this to fruition came from that drive to be redeemed by him. So, so that was a, a, a big part of the original motivation, I think. So, so then you found yourself at Purdue, and at this time, you know, you were trained as a classic structural strategic family therapist, which most people, if you were practicing family therapy in the day, that was what you were doing, which is uh, in some ways very much related uh, to what would become IFS, except it's internal instead of external. But talk about uh, your time there at Purdue and mention our uh, mentor, Doug uh, Sprinkle, and how that kind of set the stage for your development of the model. Yeah, I came to Purdue having studied structural, not directly from Mnuchin, actually influenced by Howie, who was stu studying with Mnuchin. And uh, really came thinking I, you know, I had a corner on the market, both in terms of psychotherapy in general and family therapy, uh, that I'd found the Holy Grail and came in a fairly know-it-all, obnoxious way to Purdue, where I, I mainly was going to get the the union card, you know, to get the PhD, and was lucky that Doug was my teacher there because he fairly quickly was able to disabuse me of the, the idea that I knew it all, and introduced me to a bunch of other things that I had not been that interested in, and in particular the work of Bowen and Satir and uh, these were people I knew who had been not only focused on the, the network of family relationships, but also on individual uh, qualities, I guess, within families, which, because I was such a zealous systems guy, I had kind of eschewed as, as I did anything intrapsychic, because uh, we knew we could change all that intrapsychic stuff by simply reorganizing these external relationships. So, but I did get interested in those two in particular in addition to structural and uh, and Doug was instrumental in that and, and really just spent many hours just uh, brainstorming and discussing all these concepts. And You know, I've never asked you, what was your dissertation on? <laughs> My dissertation was uh, on Satir's idea of uh, self-esteem being affected by congruent communication. So there was a communication package for couples called the Minnesota Couples Communication Program developed by a guy named Sherrod Miller. And I learned that and gathered together a bunch of couples and taught it to them and also measured their self-esteem. and. Uh, found at the end uh, there was a correlation, but like most of these things, in the follow-up it didn't hold up. And it uh, turned out that you couldn't just change this, this thing called self-esteem by a few weeks of uh, new kind of communicating. So when I think of the letters IFS, I think of three other letters, and that's IJR, and that stands for the Institute of Juvenile Research, and that was in Chicago in the, in the 80s, um, and that was really a special place, I know, for you as far as a think tank with great minds to sit there and work with families, think about systems, and that was really the birthplace of internal family systems. Talk about IJR, um, the people you worked with, and the birth of IFS. Yeah, great. So, yeah, I graduated from Purdue and then immediately took a job at this Institute for Juvenile Research, which was uh, ultimately part of uh, the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois. So it was, a, like you said, a little state-supported think tank. And we ran uh, this little family therapy training program and when I came there, 
Uh, Doug Brandlin and Celia Falakoff were running it, and so I joined them, and Celia left right away, and a woman named Betty Carr. And then, uh, after maybe a year, I recruited Howie Little, so he was there with us for... Just for our listeners, let's uh, timestamp this. What year are we at now, Dick? I think we're at about 1980, 81, or somewhere in that vicinity. And uh, it was back in the glory days when the state would fund the places like this, where we would just sit around and watch each other work with families and brainstorm. And, you know, a lot of useful things came out of that. Howie was, had a big interest in family therapy supervision, so we did a book, edited book on that. Um, Doug and I developed something called Meta Frameworks there and put out a book on that, which included IFS in the, in the early stages of it as one of the chapters. And uh, The Meta Framework of the Mind. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was an amazing place, and, and we would spend a lot of time with our students, and, and it was at that point that I decided I was going to really prove that family therapy worked. And, uh, you know, Mnuchin claimed to have this great outcome with anorexia in one of his books. He never published a study about it, but that was his claim. And so that got me interested in eating disorders, and uh, a colleague, uh, Mary Jo Barrett, who you probably know, uh, was a student of mine at the time and then graduated and we decided to do a, a treatment study on bulimia, which was a kind of new syndrome at the time. Nobody had really heard much about. And we hooked up with a, a local eating disorder group and they gave us a bunch of referrals. And we had about 30 bulimic kids and their families go through a family therapy course. And it was mainly structural strategic. And, uh, and you know, it's when prophecies fail because uh, we could reorganize the families just the way the book said to do it. And especially a bunch of my kids didn't realize they'd been cured and they kept binging and purging. And so I began asking why and uh, at, this, at the time feeling guilty for actually asking an individual about their inner world. But, but they started talking this language of parts. And, uh, and so that was really the inception of IFS. Your clients basically taught you the model. It was in, induced from the ground up from listening to your client. Yeah, I didn't know from parts. I thought we have one mind and we have a bunch of different... Uh, feelings and thoughts and so on, but uh, they were talking about these little entities inside that could make them do things they didn't want to and interacted with each other all the time. So it was it was actually fascinating from a systems point of view. So instead of, yes, reorganizing the external family, this is the family within the mind, the parts. Yeah, and they would talk about the way they interacted that sounded very similar to the, what I was studying with families. And so I, I thought, okay, let's try out some family systems theory and also technique on this internal network of parts. And uh, I was lucky. I had a couple of clients who were really articulate about the whole thing, and they would sort of co-create experiments with me. And I'd have them go home and, and try to relate differently to some of these voices, and they'd come back and tell me how it went. I mean, part of being a model developer and forging new pathways, you, you have to believe in your model, and you have to be resilient. Uh, talk about the, especially, you know, with uh, family therapy, the way it was, the, the backlash to, or if not backlash, uh, hesitance from some other people to kind of understand what you were doing because it's uh, IFS, uh, which is very popular now, a, a devout following. I mean, 
to get that way, you had to endure uh, some struggles and some growth. Talk about what that was like and, and, protects, and perhaps overcoming some initial rejection from the field. Yeah, thanks, uh, Eli. That, there's a, I got scars from that time sure. that I've worked with. But, you know, I was a kind of traitor to the cause in, in the systems, the pure systems family therapy world. And I, at that time, was a bit of a rising star. I had co-authored the basic text that was the most popular textbook. We've, we've all read it, Nichols we've and read Schwartz. It. Nichols and Schwartz. So, uh, you know, for me, as I was starting to have some kind of stature in the field to betray the cause and start thinking about individual stuff, uh, I, I had a lot of, including to some degree, my colleagues at uh, IJR, uh, and it was really, really hard for them to go with me and to, to support me initially. And, uh, and then it, when I would present on this at AFTA or AMFT, uh, there would be people in the audience uh, whose names I won't <laughs> mention, but prominent names, who would get up and, and tear into it. And then at the other side, uh, this department of psychiatry was very psychoanalytic. And so I would try to present my ideas in front of these psychiatrists or psychiatry residents. And, and uh, there was a, one time in particular at Grand Rounds where I was just read the riot act by this guy Merton Gill, who was a prominent uh, uh, self-psychologist and how dangerous what I was doing was and he actually went to my boss who at the time was Lee Conrad Graham another prominent family therapist at the time and tried to get me fired and and she she stood by me which I'm really grateful to so yeah there was a lot and uh, you know at that time I mentioned this sense of worthlessness that drove me, but to deal with the worthlessness, I had developed a part that didn't give a shit about anybody. <laughs> and so was I... That, was that a manager? Yes, very much a manager, protector. And so I could get up in front of people like that and, and take a licking and write them off, basically. And, uh, you know, my exiles would still get hurt, but this part was pretty dominant, and uh, and so I just kept going, the combination of of the the part that wanted to prove my value to my father and, and the world, and then this part that didn't care what others thought, and could be quite arrogant and obnoxious at times, as I look back, uh, got me going with the whole thing, and, and got me got it to have a, a kind of momentum uh, that was, you know, at that point, mainly among my students and some, some colleagues, but uh, was pretty small in the early days. This would be like 83, 84. And, uh, but it just kept me going. And then, of course, those parts turned out to not be that useful when I had to become a leader of a community. And so I was lucky to have some students and colleagues who had the courage to confront me and make me actually do some work on myself so that I, I could unload a lot of the worthlessness and that I didn't have to be so driven and I didn't need the accolades anymore in the same way. We're using language, uh, and again, this, the, it's beyond that kind of scope of a special interview like this to give a, a lecture on, on IFS, but we're referencing, you know, three major parts, the managing parts, the firefighting parts that act out, and what they protect is the, the very young uh, exiled parts uh, which carry the burden as Dick was mentioning and one of the things about listening to you is you're always authentic and I mean you own your parts and, and you know them uh, one question that I've always had for you is I mean as you deepen your self-knowledge and as the self leads you 
deepen an understanding of these parts. So those core, core parts that you had as a young man when you develop when you were developing the model, are they still there, or they have they evolved over the years? Yeah, uh, the for sure the arrogant I don't give a shit part is totally go not gone. It's just totally changed, and uh, I most most of the time uh, people. Uh, a comment on how humble I seem for somebody at my level, and and that actually is genuine. I've, I've really done lots of work so that uh, I don't need to feel to feel uh, patted on the back all the time, and that I actually do feel quite humble in terms of uh, what I've done. I, I feel good about what I've done, but I don't feel like. It's because I'm any kind of genius. I feel like I, I really just followed the data and worked on myself to be a, a good vessel to bring this. And you've tapped into something universal. Everybody can relate to the concepts of parts, whether you're a kid, you're an adult, whether you're high-functioning or low-functioning. It is a universal language. Yeah, that's and, and I, you know, I deserve credit for listening to my clients. But a lot of it was not at all intuitive to me at all. So it was, you know, what, uh, who was it? Uh, there's a concept of radical empiricist that uh, I'm blocking out his name. Uh, and, and that's what I consider myself, that I just would follow the data even though it took me way outside my paradigm and continues to many times. So When you think of introducing this concept is, is uh, you know, I remember uh, the first time I met you, I was about 22 years of age, I'm 40, 41 now. So I remember when I started in the field very professionally young, chronologically young, I don't, I don't think I was ready uh, for the, uh, the depth and gravitas of, of a model like this. And in fact, uh, I remember someone in my supervision group who uh, Dick was working at the Family Institute at Northwestern at uh, Northwestern University at the time, and he had just left, and I had just gotten there. And the um, person I was working with came to the Family Institute just to work with Dick and, and, and learn the model. And I remember she spoke in parts language, everything through that through that lens. And I wasn't at a point in my life where uh, I was ready for that. And I didn't, uh, you know, my managers and my firefighters, so to speak, uh, didn't really allow me to, to grasp the model. So this is a model that grows with you. But how do you how do you teach it to people that might be suspect that work on the external and not the internal? How do you introduce it to uh, skeptics or very professionally young or chronically, chronologically young therapist? Uh, um, so I don't actually have to do that that much anymore, but uh, the fact now that we're evidence-based and I can point to a lot of data uh, saying that this really works, whether or not you want to believe it, is very helpful. <clears throat> and then I think the culture has moved because back in the days you're talking about, uh, the idea that the mind was multiple was very, very pathologized, both uh, by the idea of multiple personality disorder, so having alters or parts meant that you were crazy, and just the general idea that the mind is unitary, that, that uh, you, like I originally thought, you have various thoughts and emotions, but they don't represent little entities inside of you. It, it was a real tough sell culturally back then. But subsequently, like things like more recently, the movie Inside Out, I don't know if you saw it. But oh, it's, it's, uh, it's the living embodiment of what we're talking about here, it's going from pathologizing uh, to normalizing, and nothing is more normalizing and and mainstream than a Disney Pixar film. For exactly. Sure. Yeah. So things like that have helped a lot. And in fact, we're now collaborating with Pixar. We have we just signed a contract with them. Wow. To, Can you share any any of what uh, what that will lead to? Yeah. The idea, if we can raise the money, is to make some public service announcements uh, where the little girl in the movie is watching a famous uh, uh, athlete, and we negotiating with different athletes at the moment. 
and maybe watches uh, John McEnroe throw his racket or something, and you'll see his parts played out, and then you see her parts start to imitate that, and, and, and so on. It goes on from there, but it's, it's, that's the concept. So we're just really lucky that they're willing to let us use their, those characters. When you started the uh, Center for Self-Leadership, obviously the, the, your model had developed quite a following. And uh, talk about what that has led to. And, and really, when you talk to devout followers of IFS, they like it. Certainly it helps their clients. But this is a model, clearly, if you don't have an understanding of your own parts, I, I think people go to your workshops and your retreats uh, as much as their ability to help their clients, it's about their self-discovery and growth. It is really a model of, of self-growth, uh, whether you use it with your clients or not. Um, there, there is a um, huge growth factor in going through one of your trainings. Talk about the, the popularity from that perspective. Yeah, another good question. So um, what we find, because in addition to these parts, as you know, there's what I call the self which is a kind of essence inside of everybody uh, that can't it's, be damaged. It's the integrator and the leader of all uh -huh. of the parts. Exactly. And the therapists also have that. And when anybody accesses self, you, you exhibit all these qualities that uh, actually facilitate healing, both internally and externally. So. For example, when I work with couples or families, a lot of what I'm doing is helping each family member, when they get into conflict, pause, focus inside, listen to what parts have been speaking to each other, and come back when they can speak from this open-hearted self-place for those parts, and find that just that act of holding people in that state heals their relationship. They, they then take over and know how to have better communication. You don't have to teach communication skills and so on. <clears throat> and so the idea of therapists being in that state when they're with clients, regardless of what kind of therapy you're doing, uh, is terribly important. And so in our trainings, a lot of the, the time we're spending helping therapists get to know that state and all the <clears throat> kind of markers of how you know when you're in it and then when they're not in it and how what common parts get triggered when they're with clients and how to notice when a, a part is getting triggered and, and get it to step back is our language in the moment so that you can open your heart again even in the face of provocation from clients so and much like a much like a family member uh, that is resistant or hesitant to treatment, be, before you can get that part to step back, whether it be a firefighter or a, or a manager, you first got to honor that part. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I would always think the difficult thing with therapists that, especially sometimes young therapists or insecure therapists that want to act as you know they are expert like the model taught them to kind of disarm them um to teach them this model because if you don't come in uh, in, in touch and access your own vulnerable parts your exiled parts it's impossible to deliver the model effectively to somebody else so how do you help a therapist that's really guarded and is trying to be an expert in a pro kind of disarm them and uh connect to those uh, more vulnerable parts yeah well <clears throat> if you know if i'm training them directly I'm going to talk to them about that, and, and, and we do talk in our, in our trainings about how if you're going to want to go deep with anybody, and th by that I mean past the client's protectors to their exiles, then you have to do that work with yourself because there's a, I just wrote the second edition of the original book, co-authored it, uh, the 95 book, and in it, I have a chapter called uh, The Laws of Inner Physics. And one of those laws is that you will relate to people when they resemble one of your parts in the way you res relate to that part. So if you're with a client and suddenly 
they start to cry or become very, very sad, it'll resonate with your own exiles. And if you're afraid of or disdaining of those parts of you, it's going to be very hard for you to keep your heart open with your client. And so I would lay something like that out to the therapist and say, you know, so you, if you're going to do this work, you don't have to do this kind of work. There's lots of other therapies where you don't have to get your hands dirty this way. You don't have to go to these these places. But if you're going to do this kind of work, you have to work on these protectors of yours and you have to get some kind of relationship with your exiles. And uh, may recommend that strongly that they do some IFS therapy or that in the training they actually uh, and as you know we we always work with and honor protectors first so we would encourage them to do that and get permission to go to those exiles I think that's a great part of your if, if, uh, if you're listening to this and you're interested in the model um, not as much to use with your clients but to get past your your own kind of block and to deepen your understanding of your interface issues or whatever. I, I, I think of IFS as, as the therapist therapy. Uh, many people I know that don't practice IFS want to go and have that experience and go to a, a certified internal family systems therapist just for these reasons you're saying. You told us about your kind of evolution and your arrogant parts kind of taking a step back and, and this more humble uh, part of you emerging over the years. What, through your own work and discovery, your part. What is the biggest thing you've learned about yourself that uh, you didn't know when you when you started doing this? Uh, I had no idea how much shame and worthlessness I was carrying. I just thought I was <clears throat> it was really cool, and uh, uh, I mean, I would I would uh, have trouble sitting still sometimes I you know, had a what was probably misdiagnosed as a taste of ADHD at the time and uh, I if I was alone for too long I, I could tell I was I didn't feel good um, but I I had good protectors and they you know they I was uh, in college a football star and and they I was fairly popular and they just kept me focused outside, and, and uh, they kept the, the social rewards coming. So it wasn't until I really had to, I was faced with the limits of these protectors uh, that I actually learned that about myself. Yeah, one of the end goals of IFS is unburdening, if you could explain that to our listeners and talk about your own, if we're getting real personal here, your own personal unburdening process. Okay, yeah, so the idea, and, and this actually I think is one of the biggest ideas that I, I'm trying to bring, because by and large uh, our field and our culture has mistaken parts for the burdens they carry. So the critic we think of is just this internalized critical voice. Uh, the inner critic and uh, the binge is some kind of acting out impulse and so on and when you think of them that way it makes sense to fight with them or try to squeeze them out somehow but in in doing this work with clients I came to learn that those impulses or the, that critical voice or all those things weren't the essence of the part. They were actually extreme beliefs and emotions that the part carried and got from uh, times in the past, traumas or attachment injuries, and uh, where you had that direct experience from a parent or somebody. And so the part then absorbs or takes in those extreme beliefs and emotions and thereafter is driven by those almost like they were a virus and so once a part is willing to let go of all that uh, what we call unburdened these are what we call burdens that they take in 
then they immediately transform into their naturally valuable states, almost uh, miraculously, like a curse has been lifted. And uh, so that idea that parts aren't what they seem, and in fact, you can go to your biggest inner enemy and get to know it and help it unburden. You gotta love all your parts. Every, every part, there aren't any bad ones. I'm sort of the Will Rogers of the phenomenon. I never met a part I ultimately didn't like, and I've done this with murderers and people who've sexually abused kids and so on. And even those parts, when they're allowed to tell their secret history of abuse and trauma, uh, you can open your heart to them too and help them unburden. So, and you can see the positive intention exactly. underneath the, the maybe misguided action. Yeah. Yeah, and and how they they carry the energy of their perpetrator, and that's why they were compelled to do it. And so, unloading all that, what we call legacy burdens. There are legacy burdens too that came down from uh, from your family or your ethnic group and uh, our culture. So, yeah, so this concept that, uh, that but through loving these very concrete little entities inside, they will transform, is fairly revolutionary. And uh, it runs counter to lots of spiritualities, for example, which I'm, I'm trying to bring this to, and, and, and is a tough sell, although it's, it's very congruent with other spiritual so we'll, we'll go full circle here. You talk about uh, how you felt about your father and being the oldest uh, son of all these brothers to, to live up to this and lead the way. Um, I am curious how you unburdened uh, that in your family of origin and then what your dad uh, thought of where you evolved your career to. And really, you know, when I've been doing these interviews – Listeners and those, I always ask these model developers, and, and many of their family of origin uh, didn't really grasp the importance of their family members' work. Uh, in fact, you mentioned Doug, and was it Doug's memorial. The Doug's Doug's family really had no idea of what he accomplished. They just knew him as Doug, this uh, a lovable, affable uh, family member, dad, brother. So I am curious, not only your personal unburdening process, but what your family of origin thought of what you were able to do with your career and your model? Yeah, so, um, you know, to give my father a lot of credit, I, I think he, as I got passionate about first family therapy and then this internal stuff, uh, he, he was very happy to see me have some kind of direction and passion and became much, much more supportive. And... Uh, interested. Uh, he once told me years ago, he, he, instead of going into internal medicine and endocrinology, he actually had toyed with the idea of being a psychiatrist, but then when he looked into it, he saw how much bullshit there was in the field and uh, decided not to. So I think he had a kind of hidden interest in this work, which who knows how much of that <laughs> I was playing out for him. And, uh, and so he became a kind of mentor too, because uh, he knew all the ins and outs of academia and uh, just, a, just a really valuable advisor. And uh, when I started on the, the inner path with parts, he was very skeptical. Um, and because, uh, you know, he was in his head most of the time. He, he didn't think of himself that way at all. But down the road, he, he really came to appreciate that too. And uh, actually, when, when he retired, he got very depressed and asked me to help him. And so I wound up doing a series of sessions with him, which was amazingly uh, amazing experience. And ran into the part of him that had tormented me so much and, and came to realize that it had done the same to him. And, uh, and then found his exiles, and, and all of that was very healing for me, too, to, to be with my father, who had given me these burdens, and to have him let me help him heal, and also uh, appreciate it. Um, 
Although, you know, after each session, he'd say some version of, you know, that was an interesting fantasy, Dick. You know? <laughs> his, uh, uh, his protective managing parts came back up. He could not sit in that uh, vulnerability uh, for an uh, extended period of time. But uh, what a kind of full circle experience. So you kind of experientially uh, taught him the model and helped him uh, as kind of a double unburdening, if you will, your unburdening and his. What an amazing story. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Um, I, when I think, what are your, I know you have two daughters. What are your... Three daughters. Your kid, three daughters. So what do your, your daughters think of the model? Uh, <laughs> for a long time, because, uh, you know, they were sort of subjected to it. Or, and so a long time they would say, get out of here with that part shit, daddy. That was <laughs> the, main, the main attitude. And then uh, my oldest daughter got a MSW. And for a time when I was uh, separated and divorced from my first wife, lived with me when she was going through graduate school and was doing an internship. And she, she <laughs> came home one night and kind of as a, almost like a drive-by uh, I'm sitting there watching TV, and she says, uh, I used the model today, Dad, and just kept walking. <laughs> and uh, so it, it was similar that she couldn't really, you know, they, I think they all see IFS as having pulled me out of the family and contributed to the end of my first marriage, their, their mother suffering, uh, which there's some truth to. And so they're all, I think they're all kind of ambivalent about it, but they're, you know, they, they're respectful and they come to conferences once in a while. And so it is, it is something, you know, we always ask very successful, um, model developers. One of the reasons is, you know, I'm a common factors, this guy. And one of the reasons these models are so powerful because the person really believes in it. Uh, it is their allegiance and their belief in themselves uh, that instills hope. I know you, you consider yourself a hope merchant. You have to buy it to sell it, and I, I believe that too. But uh, also your evolution, it really does feel like you have reached this, um, whether you call it your self-leading or this inner peace, your humility, I, I feel like uh, your work-life balance is, is better. I mean, do you feel um, that you are in a better place with that as far as how you balance your um, dedication to your career and promulgating the model versus your self-care and, and focus on your family? Well, interesting you should ask that because uh, my w wife, my current wife, Jean, and I have been talking about that more lately. I've just come out of a really, uh, uh, a year of lots and lots of travel. You know, part of the, the when the gods want to punish you, they answer your prayers kind of thing. So whatever reason, IFS has exploded the last five years, and I'm bombarded by invitations. And parts of me are still stuck back when nobody would listen to me and think, if I turn anything down, that it'll all dry up. So I, I'm still working with that. So as a result, uh, it's, it's the balance has shifted in an unhealthy way. And so we're just figuring out how to how to figure, how to get more balance back. Um, yeah, and, and one of the ways is that she's going to look over every invitation and, and, and uh, keep an eye on my schedule, because I, I, <laughs> I don't totally have control over this part that uh, wants to do everything. It's wants to do everything and, and spread the spread the word. Uh, the, these are the last series of questions. Is you know you know people can read the books, they can watch you do the work. And by the way, if you've never, one of the thing I think the popular is model Dick has very good training tapes that you can easily get a hold of. And it, when you see the work being done, it is very powerful. When you see someone almost go into a trance-like state and you can you know, hear Dick is consistent in all settings, his voice is very soothing. And when you see those very primitive, uh, young, exiled parts come out, it is very powerful. Um, and and he, he has a lot of training tapes to kind of capture that. Um, but what is one thing that you'd want 
listeners to know about you that can't be captured in a book, a journal article, or a standard interview? What is uh, central to yourself that you don't think um, can be captured in some standard way? I think that I... uh, that I'm a pretty ordinary guy who has only really one talent and am one of these very lucky guys who found a path to use that talent. And uh, so I feel very, very fortunate for that. And so that's part of why I feel so humble. I mean, I, I'm in awe of other people who have these amazing memories and uh, uh, abilities to think profoundly about neurobiology and so on and so on. I, I just have still have no no head for that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, One of the other common factors, uh, in addition to belief in yourself and in your model, that I've I've learned from interviewing these pioneers and model developers is is the love of doing the work. I mean, now entering in your fourth decade, I mean, you love doing the work just as much as you did uh, when you started. And I feel the same way. I mean, clinical work, uh, working with individuals, couples, and families energizes my writing, my teaching, my training. So I, I still believe you you love it as much as you did when you started. And you can always, psychotherapy is one of the greatest professions. And as long as you're attuned, you're right. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, but as long as you're attuned and present, uh, you can always get better. You can always learn more about yourself through working with other people. Talk about your love for still doing this work all these years later. Yeah, I love it more, actually, because I I can be in the state I'm calling self- self-leadership through a whole session almost always now and there's something sort of joyful and sacred and you just feel privileged to be with the client or clients as uh, as they journey this way and uh, and I just don't have my parts interfering at this point now almost always they trust me to stay and they don't jump in like they used to and so when I can do that it's like I meditated for an hour and I feel refreshed and uh, sort of in love with the client and and uh, it does I don't feel drained I can do a bunch of sessions without and I can teach it's the same thing when I'm teaching and I can be in self and I'm not worried about impressing anybody uh, I, I wind up just feeling uplifted afterwards. So, uh, so you're, you're right, Eli. We, we have a profession, uh, unlike so many people, where I don't think I'll ever retire because I love it so much. I, I do need to find a better balance, as we've been talking about. But, uh, uh, yeah. Well, that bleeds in kind of to the next question about, you know, your, your work is not done uh, what what goals do you have for this uh, the future or the next chapter of your career or the the future of IFS? When I first stumbled into particularly the the trust that everybody has the self in there, and that that took a year or two of really seeing it over and over in people that had horrible histories even, uh, and that we could access it quickly. I got a big vision. Like, this could change everything if this became common knowledge. And so that vision is still there. Uh, And uh, now, again, in the last several years, there are more and more opportunities presenting themselves to actually take it to these higher levels, or at least teach people who have access to higher levels. So we're bringing it, for example... We're going to run a special training for uh, a company called uh, McKinsey, which is a big consulting firm, and a a sister company there is called Mobius, and and they, you know, they coach presidents of countries and uh, and big CEO types, big corporations, and so and then we're also bringing it to. we run a training for mediators and people that do a lot of conflict resolution 
who work internationally. And so, you know, I still have that vision. It's not going to happen in my lifetime, but I'm just trying to get as enough momentum in that direction that when I die, it'll keep going. And uh, so that, you know, the, the vision of it becoming common knowledge, that this is who we really are, and that there are these parts that aren't what they seem, and that you can just love yourself and love each other in this different way, uh, that that becomes like a cultural meme. I mean, you're alluding to it, but um, the last question I always ask at this point of the interview is what you want your professional legacy to be, and what do you want to be remembered for most by the field of MFT specifically, and certainly psychotherapy in general? Uh, yeah, it's sort of what I just said, that, uh, <laughs> that he changed everything. And it's not even, it's more that this way of understanding changed everything. And it, I'm just one of, of many sources of it. And uh, yeah, the IFS is only one of, of a number of different similar kinds of things that are kind of converging, I think, uh, from different areas. I've just built a friendship the last year with a guy named Gabor Mate. Do you know that name, Eli? I do not. Tell us about him. Yeah, so he wrote a book called In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts and uh, is a leader now in a different understanding of addiction and also of, of uh, medical symptoms. and it's very, very compatible with the way I understand things. He just didn't talk about it in terms of parts before. But uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy with a world reputation now and, and really excited about IFS now. So uh, he and I are going to collaborate and so on. So I'm, I'm hooking up with him and, and people like Bessel van der Kolk and other people who have a lot of influence, uh, both culturally and within our field and um, so so I do believe that uh, this is my legacy and that it's it's a solid contribution I feel really proud of it and that it's one of many streams that are heading in this kind of learn to love if you can love yourself inside you can love people outside well I appreciate yeah, everything we've talked about this hour, I don't think you've probably ever done an interview quite like this. I have and, not. Uh, <laughs> it's been and, great. Uh, you let me go to those places, and that's because you are secure in your own parts and also humble enough to know there are many pathways to tap into what you're talking about. And you, you, know, you didn't uh, reinvent the wheel. You just tapped into something pure within people. Um, I totally and, believe that. Yeah, yeah, I believe that too. And uh, I really appreciate your time, and I think people will learn a lot from listening to this. Thank you so much, Dick. Thank you, Eli. I feel very respected and uh, really, uh, you know, you're a great interviewer. Thank you, sir. Thank you again, Dick Schwartz, for a, an incredibly intimate uh, look behind the curtain and covered a, a lot of history there, past, present, and future of internal family systems. The Pioneer Series, again, one of my favorite parts, talking to the people that have shaped our field as systemic therapist. You know, in addition to that, we love to get feedback, and I've gotten actually a really nice amount of feedback on our last episode where we were talking about the minority student experience in MFT programs. Um, getting a lot of feedback from students that really loved what Shiza and Leslie said, and program directors as well, saying it gave them ideas to continue the dialogue and be more intentional uh, about diversity in the therapy room and in the classroom. So again, we thrive on feedback like that, and we'll bring you uh, throughout 2020 you know, more episodes of the podcast focused on increasing cultural diversity. You heard me mention in there, and I often speak of the uh, interest networks of AMFT, again, the new AMFT that gives you member choice. So uh, you know, I, we talked in that episode that was recorded at a national conference about what, how great it would be if there was a special interest network uh, for cultural diversity. And guess what? Now there is. Uh, I was made aware by uh, the chair of the newly formed for 2020 Margins to Center. 
Uh, and Margins and Center is a special interest network all about a kind of cultural diversity uh, and increasing cultural connections among and cultural competencies among couple and family therapists. And you can find out more about that. I was contacted by the chair, Dr. Camille Lafleur, and I really appreciate her for listening and her her good uh, feedback. So they are open and and ready to go. And in the coming months, you can check um, networks dot amft dot org slash margins to center networks dot amft dot org slash margins to center and uh, on becoming a member you're going to be able to find all uh, networking for support and discussion and collaboration there's going to be qu- quarterly trainings to inform uh, uh, cultural competency and they're talking about case consultations uh, uh, around mental health challenges for people of color and you know, other concerns the network members are going to have. So again, the new AMFT is all about you and member choice. So I hope you'll uh, check out this Margins to Center group. And as always, uh, please follow us. All of the the back episodes you can find at amft.org. You can listen to us wherever you get your favorite podcast. I like Apple Podcasts. Please, it really helps us if you leave a, a review and a rating. Rise through the ranks of the Mental Health Podcast. Best way to get a hold of me is info at elikaram.com. That's E L I K A R A M.com. Uh, you can reach the AMFT at communications at amft.org. Follow the conversation on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Eli Live, and the AMFT is simply at the AAMFT. Hashtag Stay Systemic and the AAMFT Podcast. Until next time, my friends, stay systemic. <laughs>